Amen. Amen. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. <clears throat> we begin with our Maria for the distance. Our Abba Maria, gracia plena, dame secum, benecta tu rebus, benectus fructus ventris tu Jesus. Tota pulcra es. Thou art all beautiful. On the eve of today's feast day, which is St. Vincent de Paul, St. Catherine of Lourdes saw with her own eyes the extraordinary beauty of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the first apparition of Our Lady to her in the year of our Lord, 1830. The Blessed Virgin Mary is, in fact, the most beautiful of God's creation. She is the masterpiece of the Blessed Trinity. Since Vatican II, however, with its poisoning of the faithful with modernism and partisanism, many baptized Catholics today have an obscured image of Our Lady's perfections, to the point of considering her as a normal woman, which is actually a blasphemy. Therefore, the truth of the matter should be explained in detail during using the wisdom of the Church Fathers and doctors of the Church, and also with Holy Scripture, which we'll do today. The Catholic writer Father Cyril explains in his classic work called The Mother of God, explains that the Catholic Church has, all, has only breathtaking things to sing about the Blessed Virgin Mary. Philosophers have spun syllogisms and sophisms of over the possibility of creating the best creature possible. And yet no philosophy can take us anywhere near an understanding of the all but infinite perfection of this marvelous creature. Our Blessed Lady is the only thing whom God created precisely to show what a good thing He can make. And He has succeeded, of course, beyond all doubt. This masterpiece of His hands has corresponded so well with His ideals and ambitions that He has simply no wish to make another. Our Lady's perfection is of an order surpassing that of all other creatures, not merely in de degree, but even in kind. She is, as the Book of Wisdom says, the, the brightness of the eternal light, the unspotted mirror of the majesty of God, and the image of His goodness. She is the unspotted mirror of the majesty of God. What does that mean? The metaphor of the mirror is very much to the point. All objects reflect the rays of the sun, but the mirror does it in a manner altogether different. Only in the mirror can we see the sun because only the mirror reflects its rays, of, its rays perfectly, without distortion or decrease. All other objects reflect light in their own imperfect and distorted way, and thus revealing themselves and not revealing themselves and not the sun itself. Moreover, all creatures are the footprints and images of God in their own remote and imperfect way. Only the Blessed Virgin Mary is immaculate mirror, the perfect picture of God. Only Mary is the image of his goodness. Of course it is true that our Blessed Mother, being a creature, is finite, but only God knows her limits. To all others, Mary is all but infinite. She is the only creature that is absolutely perfect, free from all defects, and endowed with every gift, both natural and supernatural, in the highest degree possible that can be found in any pure creature, yet God has decreed. In that sense, Mary is the most perfect creature possible. Why? Because she has attained the peak of perfection that God has decreed as realizable by creatures and because she has given God the maximum glory he wishes to derive from creation. It is 
in a way, a philosophy, of course, but idle all the same to argue that no creature is the best possible one because God can always make a better one, according to philosophers. Now, there's one thing for God to have the power to create and, and another thing to have the will. And in this case, we have here a creature that is Mary, whom God made to display all his wisdom and all his goodness and power and who has corresponded perfectly with his designs. In other words, it, 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 to express it in our own imperfect terms, Almighty God has exhausted his ordinary almighty power in creating this perfect creature. This is what St. Bonaventure meant when he explained Mary's perfection with the following words. He said, Mary is that being than which God cannot make a greater. He can make a greater earth and a greater heaven, but not a greater mother. End quote. Now philosophers are free to talk about her limitations. Nonetheless, Pope Pius IX, in his encyclical in Nefabilities Deus, definition of the back conception, assures us that her perfection is such that nothing beyond it is conceivable under God, and none can ever comprehend it but God. And St. Thomas Aquinas was putting it mildly when he wrote in his Summa Theologica that, quote, all that pertains to perfection must be found in the Blessed Virgin Mary. Our day's perfections belong to the natural and to the supernatural orders, and in both Mary is the last word of God. Even the natural perfection of her body and soul makes her the gem of creation and the wonder of the angels. The church does not scruple to apply to her these words of wisdom, quote, she, for she is a vapor of the power of God and a certain pure emanation of the glory of the mighty God. And therefore no defiled thing cometh into her. She is more beautiful than the sun, and above all, the order of the stars. Being compared with the light, she is found before it. The sacred scriptures are full of allusions to our Blessed Mother's exquisite beauty and perfection, and the Catholic Church seems to fall into an ecstasy of delight as she gathers these scriptural blossoms, into a wreath of liturgical praise. Here are a few of the refrains. Thou art all fair, O Mary, our original stain is not in thee. Thou art most beautiful and sweet, O Holy Mother God. Rejoice, O Virgin most glorious, beautiful above all else, most exclusively adorned, and pray to Christ for us. Who is she that ascends like the rising dawn, beautiful as the moon, glorious as the sun, Formidable like an army in battle array. And the fathers of the church have caught up the strains and vied with one another, extolling the perfections of the Blessed Virgin Mary. They seem to know no limits when they speak about her, and yet they are far too sober and saintly to be carried away by mere enthusiasm. They represent the infallible tradition of the church. For example, Venusius, the Carthusian, was merely borrowing from the earlier fathers when he wrote the following, quote, from head to foot, there was absolutely nothing in the Blessed Virgin, either in body or in soul, that might be in the least unbecoming, repre reprehensible, or indecorous. Indeed, the whole was formed by the infinite wisdom of God and most beautifully arranged and exquisitely finished with nothing superfluous or out of the way. For as it is proper that the humanity of Christ should shine with all the perfections of nature and grace in the highest degree of excellence by reason of the hypostatic union, so after Christ, his mother should have the same excellence for after the hypostatic union, there's nothing so intimate as the union of the Mother God with her Divine Son.
Moreover, this consummate perfection belonged not merely to her soul, but even to her body. Richard Victor, Victorinus has said, quote, It is no wonder that she is radiant when, whom the rays of glory have filled, that she is beautiful who has contained the effluence of light. There is no doubt that this fire of divine love and interior radiance shone out exteriorly also, so that she, had, she who had the purity of angels had also an angelic countenance. St. Antonine, in his theology, says, quote, The Blessed Virgin had the, most, had the best natural gifts and the most perfect bodily proportions. And he proceeds to set forth the reasons why the evangelist made no special mention of her surpassing beauty. George of Nicomedia contemplated her beauty and broke forth in this rapturous cry, quote, Almost beauteous beauty of all beauties. O Mother of God, the fairest ornament of all beautiful things. St. Peter Damien addressed her, quote, Virgin Mother of God, whose beauty is the wonder of the sun and the moon. St. Anselm explains, quote, O thou most lovely to see, most lovable to contemplate, most delightful to love, how thou exceedest the capacity of my heart. There is a miracle passage of Richard Victorinus, who, who has long been attributed to Dionysius the Eropropagite. When Dionysius was converted to Catholic faith by St. Paul, the Apostle, St. Paul brought him to meet the Blessed Virgin Mary, who was still alive during his days, in person. And when Dionysius met her, he said, If I didn't know by faith that I've been taught there is only one God, that I would adore you as the very Godhead. You so astonished by your modesty and her beauty. St. Andrew of Jerusalem calls the Blessed Virgin Mary a living statue shaped by God himself, the incarnation of beauty at its best. To St. John Damascene, she's the masterpiece of nature and grace working together. Nonetheless, the saints were not poets alone. They have expressed their thoughts about the Blessed Virgin Mary not only in figures of speech. All their deep learning, precision of logic, and the weight of theology have been brought to bear on this subject. The theological treatise on the beauty of Mary, the mother of God, might seem almost ridiculous to the modern mind. But not so to the saints. Everything about our Blessed Lady had a special appeal for them. They studied the least detail with the, with the awe and earnestness which this, mighty, which this mighty work of God deserves. Whether or not the medieval schoolmen were preoccupied with determining the number of angels that could dance on the point of a needle, they certainly seem to have been at considerable pains to number even split every hair on our Blessed Mother's head. They have not lost a sense of supernatural values. Here is a characteristic example from the theology, the, theology of St. Antonine. He said, according to Aristotle, there is a natural power in things to procreate. Something similar to themselves. Unless, there, unless therefore nature errs or is impeded, the son will be similar to the father or the mother. Hence it follows that the divine son, who is born of a mother without a human father, by the power of God can, can neither err nor be impeded, must necessarily be similar to his mother and she to him. Now he, that is Jesus Christ, was most comely, as the scripture says, comely above all the sons of men. And the angels desired to look on him. Therefore, the Virgin Mother of God was most beautiful. End of quote. St. Thomas of Villanova expresses the same idea in almost identical words. 
St. Antonine, again, argues the same point from a slightly, slightly different angle. He says, quote, The human body is more beautiful and more noble than the bodies of all animals because of its union to a rational soul. Therefore, the nobility of the body is intended for, for and augmented by the nobility of the soul, which is its end and perfection. For the matter and form must be mutually proportionate. If, therefore, the soul of the Blessed Virgin was the most noble soul, after that of her divine son Jesus, then her body was, consequently, the most noble and most beautiful one after that of the Son. The body of the Son, being united to the divinity, was the most perfect in beauty, hence the body, most intimately and intimately related to it, must next to it in excellence, must, must be next to it in excellence and beauty. That was the body of his mother. In addition, the great angelic doctor, St. Thomas Aquinas, concludes his discussion on this subject with these words, characteristic of his solid soberness. Quote, Sanctifying grace did not only repress in the Blessed Virgin all inordinate movements, but also influenced others, too, in such a way that no one could ever have any immodest affection for her. End of quote. And St. Bonaventure quotes some Jews as claiming that the Blessed Virgin Mary had this marvelous thing about her, namely, that while she was exceedingly beautiful, no man could ever feel any carnal affection for her. This characteristically Catholic view of the Blessed Virgin Mary has had a profound influence of the whole life of the Church and found expression in all her arts. In fact, the Madonna is a central theme, inspiration, and the life of all Christian fine arts. That is, as it should be, because she is the masterpiece of God himself. Without her, we might not have had a Raphael, or a Michelangelo, or a Murillo. This explains the fact that the fine arts flourish within the Catholic Church as they do nowhere else. The saints are quite in agreement that the Blessed Virgin Mary, besides the perfection of nature, had all the preternatural gifts in a most eminent degree. She was endowed with infused knowledge and wisdom of the highest order, and had all, and had all her mental powers fully developed from the very beginning of her existence in her mother's womb, St. Anne. Her body was gifted with immortality, incorruptibility, and the rest of the prerogatives that belong to man in the garden of paradise. Conceived immaculate, she must be immune from the corruption of her father, fallen nature, fallen race. It was so with our Lord Jesus Christ, and it must be so with his blessed mother. Not that human bodies, or any material thing for that matter, can be incorruptible or an immortal of their nature. They were made so by a special privilege God had granted man in the Garden of Eden, before the fall. This same privilege belonged to Mary Immaculate in a preeminent degree. Let us listen to the wisdom of the doctor of the church, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, quote, the Blessed Virgin Mary had no stain of sin to cause death, but merely the forces of nature as they were before the fall of man. For even human nature, even then, however perfect, was of its nature mortal. However, God had given man a special privilege and grace that would overcome this tendency of nature and preserve him immortal. This was the case with the Most Holy Mother God. Our Lady, too, though overflowing with all good things and free from all, from the least stain of sin, had nevertheless the same nature that binds all men to death and was therefore mortal. Yet God had given her the privilege of immortality, 
And if she chose to use it, she could have avoided death altogether and ascended into to heaven as she was living. However, she would not use this prerogative and wish to die like her divine son Jesus before going to heaven. Mary Immaculate, pray for us. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.